looking forward to this conversation. Um, we really are looking forward to this conversation, Alan. And, um, you know, I, I won't do any lengthy introductions because I think the, as you're talking about your work, you know, that will give us what we need in terms of your background too and your interests. Um, but for those of you who are online and here in the room, Alan, you're the director, right, of the new directorate. No, that's not the title. I am a senior advisor. So uh, Erwin Gian Chandani is the director. Um, the assistant director, or excuse me, he's the assistant director. And then the deputy assistant director is Gracie Narcho, both uh, longtime NSF employees. Um, and I'm, yeah, so I'm, uh, whenever you're ready, I can I can jump in and uh, tell you about TIP and yeah. answer any questions you might have. That would be great. We are definitely in get work done mode this morning. So we're looking forward to this. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Thank you, Alan. Great. Yeah, thanks. So um, again, my name is Alan Walker, Senior Advisor. Uh, I've been at NSF about five months now. So um, I am certainly not a NSF expert. M many of you probably have worked uh, more closely with uh, NSF throughout your career, but I am a TIP expert. Um, so I'm I'm excited to share what we're doing. Uh, prior to NSF, I was in the Army, uh, and I just retired after 26 years. My last uh, assignment was at DARPA. I was um, special assistant to the DARPA director, which really got me interested in science and technology um, and brought me to TIP. So I'm going to share my screen, and please let me know if you can see it. Yep, yes. all, good. all good. Okay, great. So um, I guess bef before I get into it, I'm gonna just give you the bottom line <clears throat> up front. Um, and that is, TIP is, if, if you could uh, mute your microphones, I'm, I'm getting uh, some echo, thank you. Working on it. Thank you. So the bottom line, I would say right up front is that we are about a year and I don't know, four or five months into, um, into existence. And we are absolutely still in startup mode, um, which, which I think means that um, we are still rounding, our, our, rounding out our portfolio and we are looking for new ideas. We're looking for new partners and I think importantly, um, we and TIP are really trying to take a sort of unconventional, um, you know, look for unconventional programs that that maybe typically NSF has not frequently done, but um, but we're trying to I don't know I, you know for lack of a better expression we're trying to break glass and try uh, try new program ideas. So. Um, I'll, I'll touch on two uh, dear colleague letters that we have uh, published uh, in the last month or so, uh, a little later, but, but we really are serious about uh, new partners and new programs. The, the other thing I just wanted to mention right up front is, is really our three pillars, and I'll get into those in more detail, but I think just it might help set the stage if you understand our three focus areas. The first is to accelerate uh, diverse innovation ecosystems. And we think of um, innovation ecosystems um, in really in two ways. The first would be sort of geographic innovation ecosystems. And if you're familiar with the NSF regional innovation engines, that's an example where we're trying to really promote uh, innovation across the country. The other way we think about it is, um, I would say sort of topically. Um, and so, um, we have a program called the Convergence Accelerator, which is really trying to bring multidisciplinary teams together to solve societal problems through, through new technology. Our, our second uh, thrust area is technology translation and technology development. So translation, of course, is lab to market, although we sort of say lab to society because there are other ways that uh, new discoveries, I think, can take shape. Um, rather than just industry. 
Um, and then um, the other is the, the development part of it. Um, you're probably familiar with the Chips and Sciences Act that was passed last year. In there, there uh, it articulates 10 key technology areas. And so while TIP is technology agnostic, we are focused on those 10 key technology areas um, and trying to accelerate those. And they are pretty broad. None of them would surprise you if you're not familiar. AI, quantum, advanced materials, uh, things like that. And then the, our final thrust area is workforce development. Um, and that's um, primarily workforce development to, to, to get folks uh, into uh, high-tech careers, STEM-based high-tech careers. So those are, at a high level, our three uh, focus areas. Um, and I, I think that might help uh, as, as I go through, you can kind of keep in mind those. Okay, so, so why tip? Let me just take a, a step back if I could for a moment. So um, the National Science Board, which of course is the governing body for NSF, <clears throat> several years ago uh, published a study called Vision 2030. And in it, it lays out three uh, challenges, as you can see listed here. And it, and it, really, um, it really identifies that we are in a defining moment um, where these three challenges, um, you know, it's, we hope that NSF can uh, address those. So the first, of course, is global competition, primarily in maintaining uh, technological leadership, as we have in over many, many decades through organizations like NSF, uh, academia, and uh, others. But of course, we see some of those areas slipping uh, in terms of our uh, leadership. And so we want to accelerate that. The second is um, the, well, what the uh, National Science Board calls the missing millions. Um, and this is, this is not just TIP. This is, of course, NSF. These are NSF sort of goals here. But the missing millions is really that talent is everywhere across our nation, um, but opportunity certainly is not. So how can we provide that opportunity so that we can, we can accelerate innovation uh, across the entire US? And then third are the, the pressing social, uh, socioeconomic challenges that we have. And let me, let me briefly talk about those. So <clears throat> from climate change to equitable access to education, broadband connectivity to improving US infrastructure. Really there, you know, there is uh, momentous challenges that we face. Um, additionally, um, America's research and innovation enterprise is undergoing historic changes. Really the pace of discovery has accelerated. Um, and I would argue a lot of that is of course, just the reliance and the, the robustness of the, the data that we produce and technologies like um, AI and L that can then synthesize that, uh, that data. Additionally, I think STEM researchers and students, of course, are much more passionate about channeling their work into addressing problems that we face in our communities. So students, researchers, they want to have an impact um, and, and they are much more interested for you know, doing research that impacts society than just doing research for research's sake. And finally, uh, our STEM talent is really highly distributed um, and we need new partnership models that can blend expertise and resources across the entire US. And so we think that we can, we can meet this moment, but it's gonna take use inspired and translational research to really accelerate the discovery into practice. So that leads us to TIP, which our, our sort of key elements are translational research and use-inspired research. Um, now, you, you, I, I think you can see here the, uh, the topical focused uh, NSF directorates. There, of course, are seven um, that have been doing um, really curiosity-driven research for the last 70 plus years. Um, and by no means does NSF want to move away from that core work that we've been doing that have led to some really astounding discoveries. 
But what we do recognize is that it can take a long time for, for discoveries to make their way into having societal impact. And so that's where we see TIP coming in, is being able to be technology agnostic and focus on technologies that are promising for translation, then bring um, both the researchers and the end users together to, to sort of develop the problem statements and, and work on the research together to create solutions that are useful. Um, so that's TIP, first, uh, first new directorate in NSF for 30 plus years. And so we're excited about the opportunity um, to, to, to really meet this momentous, momentous challenge. So um, our mission, I will not read it, but it really is about uh, addressing the pivotal, uh, pivotal, pivotal challenges um, and enhancing the fundamental research that NSF has been doing. Um, now on the, so I'm not gonna, I, I will not go through this, but you can see at the end that um, it really is about keeping our leadership, our technological leadership, um, but ultimately uh, growing the U.S. economy. Um, and, and the Chips and Sciences Act is pretty clear about that. Of course, the, you know, the end state is accelerating our economy. Okay, so the valley of death. You, many, many people, I think um, in DOD, we certainly talked about um, the valley of death when I was in the army. And there are different, I think there are different meanings, but I think the, the, um, the common uh, element to all how different communities use the Valley of Death is really when, uh, when you know, how do we bridge between uh, researchers and um, private funding? Um, and that's, that's one of the key aspects that we're trying to do in TIP. Now, along the bottom, um, you can see sort of the different, I hate to use the word phases because that implies that it's linear and that it isn't always linear when you go from a good idea to a societal impact. But the bottom is really about our um, lab to market platform that I'll address. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of those programs such as i and CIVR uh, and PFI, but we have a variety of programs to, to, to really address and to help researchers bring their, their good idea to uh, the market or to society. And we're hoping that we can really alleviate the valley of death. Now, I, that's much harder than it sounds, as you know. Um, but we have, uh, we have a whole host of programs that are aimed at trying to assist this. And we, we have more on the way that, uh, that we're excited about. So we're trying to bridge the valley. And uh, I hope you can see us doing that through our, uh, our portfolio that I'll get to in a second. So one more note, I, I mentioned um, NSF, sort of traditional NSF has really been focused on curiosity driven research. That's really been, you know, investigator driven through academic teams primarily. And we think of that as more of a technology push. So you have these researchers come up with uh, fabulous ideas um, and they're trying to sort of push their ideas into the market, which can take a long, long time as we know. What we're trying to do in TIP is really br bring the users and the researchers together to, um, to, to really before the research uh, begins uh, in earnest to, to really chart the way forward, to really create, um, to, so that they can fashion um, the end state together. We hope that this is done through multi-sector teams. So uh, multi-discipline teams and multi-sector teams from nonprofits, academia, industry, et cetera. Um, and we see this as a poll because the users are involved in this. Now, I just wanna reiterate one more time on the left side is what NSF has traditionally been known for, and we are in no way um, downsizing that. In fact, we are continuing to uh, invest more on sort of the curiosity-driven research. 
But with the Chips and Sciences Act, uh, NSF received a, a fair uh, funding plus up to create TIP so that it is not in competition with the existing NSF uh, portfolio. So, um, so as I mentioned, TIP is really about integrating with the NSF's existing directorates, foster, fostering new partnerships with industry, nonprofits, um, academia, state and local governments, et cetera, um, to bring use inspired research and innovation to the entire country. So as I mentioned, I, I went through these three focus areas, but here they are again. So diverse innovation ecosystems, that's um, really creating um, that use inspired research across the country. Second is our, um, our lab to market platform and focusing on those 10 key technology areas. So accelerating development in those. And finally, our workforce development, which is really about reaching those missing millions. <clears throat> okay, so that's the background and sort of the high level what TIP is about. I'm gonna go into our portfolio now, um, really sort of as broken down by these three uh, core areas. Before I, before I just keep, talking. I, I'm going to pause to see if there are any questions since this, I think this is sort of a smaller group. Thank you, Alan. Um, I do have a couple of questions, but maybe others do too. Um, we are, we've been using the, the hand function. Um, maybe I'll just ask my clarifying questions quick. Um, it, the, you just mentioned that there is a funding plus up. Can you refresh our memories as to what the funding plus up is for specifically TIP? Yes, um, I'm going to get some of the numbers wrong, but um, but the Chips and Sciences Act increased uh, the NSF budget by about a billion dollars. Um, of that billion, about 800 million or so was for TIP. So existing NSF, um, they had a plus up of, I mean, again, my numbers are a little off here, but about 300 million, and then TIP for at least 20, uh, fiscal year 23 is about 880 million. Okay, fiscal year 23, got it, thank you. Um, and then um, you mentioned, um, uh, you know, youth-inspired um, research, translational research versus curiosity-driven research. Um, it, it's still basic research though that we're talking about, is that correct? Youth-inspired basic research or translational basic research, yes? That is a that is a very good question, and I would say we're it is basic research, but I think we're probably maybe expanding the definition of basic research. So, you know, traditionally you think of basic research, applied research, and then we're calling translational research, use inspired research, somewhere in the middle. Um, we're trying to be, I would say, on purpose. We're not defining what where it, it is in that continuum. Um, because as you'll hear about in our portfolio, we are, um, some of our programs are creating proof of concepts and experiments and prototypes. And that traditionally has not been the realm of basic research, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but, but to us, that is very important in that translational research aspect is we, you know, we want to accelerate getting to applied or or even higher. So we we have strayed away from the traditional technology readiness level, TRL level, that um, at least we use very frequently in DOD. Mm -hmm. And we've been exploring other sort of ways of defining this. Um, and so, and, and this all goes to um, how do we know that we're, how do we measure that TIP is being successful? Um, and so we're spending a lot of time right now working through the metrics for these three core areas that I went through. Okay, we'd certainly be interested in that, um, how that evolves or maybe even provide input as a scientific community. Um, more questions, anybody have any clarifying questions so far? Yeah, I had one. Um, my experience with the ocean research community is that many of the research products that they produce they have the scientists have no clue that they have a potential market for or a potential could be developed into a potential 
product. And, and I wondered if TIP is also going to more aggressively look at some of the basic research that's going on, particularly in a place like ocean science, to see if they think it has potential and then try to encourage the, um, the PI or, or some group to take that basic research and, and move it. In other words, it's a little different than starting out with youth inspired research is to look at the basic research and try to decide what might have a real potential for market or societal benefit. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so we are, so the, the short answer is uh, yes. We, we are trying to, so um, some of our programs are, <clears throat> in fact, one of our programs with the uh, biological, uh, in coordination with uh, the bio NSF directorate is identifying basic research that, that is ripe for moving into translation uh, translational research. And we hope that this is a model that we can spread throughout all the, uh, the other topical focused NSF directorates where the program, uh, the program directors sort of in the back of their mind are always on the lookout for promising trans, you know, promising basic research. Um, we are, uh, we have planned to have uh, liaisons in TIP that uh, that from the other directorates that sit in TIP that that really can give us insight into what the other directorates are working on um, and and help us identify those technologies. Um, now, as you know, that you know NSF makes about eleven thousand awards a year, and so that you know we're absolutely going to miss some, <laughs> but. But we are trying to put a structure in place that will help identify yeah. uh, those promising areas. Yeah, and I think universities, at least for if for their part, are also doing some work to see, you know, to to encourage faculty. But we can talk about that a little bit more too. I have a related question. But Jason, another clarifying question, and then we'll have Alan continue. It's not a clarifying question. Oh. It can wait maybe until he goes through his portfolio if that make more sense. Okay, let's uh, wait. Let's Cool, Alan, well, we wanna make sure we get through all the materials. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so, so I'll start on diverse innovation ecosystems. Um, so our first program that uh, predates TIP, actually the start, uh, Convergence Accelerator started in 2019. Um, but the Convergence Accelerator is, the, the idea is to bring together multidisciplinary teams that um, really, so, NSF picks a topic area with community input. Um, we then, it's almost a competition in some ways where we'll have um, teams uh, provide uh, sort of proposals based on the, the general topic area that we have. Uh, if they are selected for phase one, they get uh, $750,000 for nine months to, to mature their idea. Um, and then they compete for phase two funding, which as you can see is $5 million over 24 months. At the end of that uh, 24 months, they are, um, we are looking for prototypes, proof of concepts, uh, experiments. So something tangible that can come out of it that is right for commercialization or societal challenges or, 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 or whatever. Um, as you can see on the right, this is uh, open to a variety of different sectors. Um, and here I'll, I'll just go to, oh, well, before I go on. So generally we run this three or four times a year with different topic areas. And you'll see the topic areas on the next slide. Um, phase one is typically about 20 teams or so. And then we down select in phase two to about five teams. Our, so our portfolio since 2019, um, you can see here, we, we've made it to track M. Um, I don't know what happens when we get past track Z. Um, I don't know what, <laughs> what we do, but you can see the variety of topics that we have really, I think sort of very diverse. Um, the most recent you can see track K, L and M. So equitable water solutions, chemical sensing and bio-inspired design. Um, we are uh, excited to partner with other organizations to help sponsor these tracks. So just as, a, as an example, um, track G, which is 5G, um, we have partnered with Department of Defense. They had some specific 5G 
use cases, let's say, that they were interested in. And so uh, that's track G. Track um, I is we partnered with Australia. They're, I, they're forgive me for, I'm going to get there, but it's basically they're one of their science organizations that has a great interest in sustainable materials. Um, and then we just recently announced that we're partnering with um, Sweden on track L for real world chemical sensing applications. And so um, most of those are, you know, one, they're all basically government agencies, some US, some not. Um, I think what we're interested in the next, the, sort of the next phase is can we partner with industry on, uh, on sponsoring any of these tracks, whether it's sharing, um, sharing costs or expertise or use cases, those kinds of things. Our next program is the Regional Innovation Engines. We call it the Engines Programs for short. Um, this is our biggest investment, sort of our flagship program. Um, the Engines is really about encouraging regions throughout the U.S. to go all in on a, uh, a technology area um, and really becoming sort of the center of the U.S. Um, that in that technology area. So we're, you know, we're not trying to create Silicon Valleys throughout the entire US. Um, we want region, you know, Silicon Valley, of course, is sort of known for its IT, but they're pretty broad. Um, we are trying to create areas that um, regions where, and these regions pick an area where they, they sort of have a, a, um, an advantage already. Maybe they're already working on this, technology area, or maybe they, they already have facilities or infrastructure, or the societal problem is really apparent in that area. So, so we want uh, an, a technology area that makes sense for the region. The a, a engine is going to require a partnership, really, amongst all sectors of the region. So uh, it needs to have strong academic, state, local, industry, you know, sort of you name it. They all need to come together. Um, to, to, to really focus on that area. Um, ultimately, so there's, there's, there's two uh, phases to this. Phase one, which is a, our, we're calling the development award, is $1 million over um, two years, really to help get a, uh, a region plant, you know, off the ground, I would say, to form those partnerships and to do, um, to do the, the initial legwork. And then they can compete for the phase two, the full scale engine, which is uh, up to $160 million for up to 10 years. We just uh, last month announced the first batch, uh, the, the first awards. Those were the development awards. I'll show you those on the next slide. Um, and then this fallish, we are going to announce our first uh, awardees for the full scale engines. Um, just I think it was last week, or maybe it was the week before we announced the semifinalists, the, the 34 semifinalists for the, the, the actual engines. And I encourage you to go to the NSF website. Um, there is an interactive map that you can see there on the left that uh, you can hover over each of those uh, gears and you can see who the uh, organizations are that have partnered. You can see their topic areas, you can see the PIs. Um, and the hope is that because we're making all this information uh, easy to find, that it doesn't have to be NSF that are encouraging regions and organizations within those regions to partner. We want, we want this to be grassroots. Um, but these are our 44 development awards. And you can see on the right, the topic areas, really a wide variety. Um, and then if you go on the NSF website, you can see the uh, the 34 finalists as well. Okay, um, a related program to the NSF engines is the EPIC program. This is um, a program to help primarily uh, academic institutions to, to sort of boost their capacity to create partnerships with engines. So this is, um, Again, this is really a companion program um, to bring sort of non-R1 universities to, to help them increase their capacity to, to partner. 
Two other related um, programs uh, with the engines. Um, the first is, you can see on the bottom left, is the builder platform. Um, so this is really a human-centered, um, you know, platform sort of makes it sound like it's an IT thing. <clears throat> this is much more than that. This is training. This is mentorship. This is tools um, and infrastructure to help a region um, ramp up and become self-sustaining. So we uh, we just so we released the solicitation um, about you can see in, in April and uh, the proposals were due. I think the proposals were due like last week, um, and so we're going through those right now. But but we see this as key to really making a uh, an engine successful. And then finally, we are um, we're still in the planning phases for this, but. We're looking at creating almost like a venture capital fund um, that that might be able to then provide uh, that that startup funding for small businesses that come out of an engine uh, to create to sort of help them reduce their technical risk and risk and become um, a, an actual company. Okay, so that's that's the engines. I'm going to move to uh, tech translation. And development. So our lab to market platform consists of uh, several programs. Um, the first is the Innovation Core or I Core. This has been going on um, for gosh, I want to say it's two thousand. I'm going to get the day wrong. Two thousand nine or so, um, or maybe it was two thousand one. I don't remember. But but this has been a, a pretty long standing NSF program, which has uh, had a a huge number of graduates, I would say. The Innovation Core uh, program is really about helping researchers find their find their market, find um, the the problem they're trying to solve. And one of its sort of famous um, exercises is uh, these teams need to they may need to make a hundred phone calls for to potential customers to really try and. Uh, answer the question like, will someone actually pay money for what I'm I'm developing here? Um, it is uh, three million dollars per team for five three million dollars per year for five years, um, and excuse me, I'm sorry. The teams get fifty thousand dollars for seven weeks. Over the last, I would say, as Several years ago, we transitioned from everything being run out of the NSF headquarters to these NSF hubs, which are spread throughout the country. You can see on the map there. That really allowed us to uh, increase our reach. I think an interesting thing about the I Corps is, you know, graduates of the I Corps program, many continue to go on and, and create a startup, but I would say many also kind of go back. To the lab and rethink what they were developing and like geez this wasn't going to work out and we see that as uh, a success as well because um it helps them really focus what their what their product is going to be a second program uh, in our lab market platform is uh, called pfi partnerships for innovation um so pfi is is helping reduce technical risk. This is pre-startup uh, formation. So this is helping um, reduce technical risk for, um, for programs that have NSF lineage. So they were funded through other NSF programs um, really to sort of begin their journey and becoming um, a startup. There, there, are two different, um, there are two different ways you can participate. The first is focused primarily on technology translation. translation. Um, and then there's uh, research partnerships. So they both are all about technology translation, um, but the research partnership adds the element that it needs to have multi-sector teams that are focused on sort of creating, as the name implies, partnerships. Those um, partnerships are primarily nonprofits uh, and academia. Okay, as we sort of think about moving through the maturity of a researcher having an idea to starting a startup, um, 
SBIR and STTR, which are also known as America's Seed Fund. Um, this is really designed to be the first funding that a startup receives. Uh, the first, um, really the first funding period. So this is, um, this is designed to help a company reduce their technical risk to make themselves really more, um, I don't know, to make themselves more interesting to private funds. Um, you can see there's three phases. You can, you can get up to almost $2 million if you go through all three phases. Um, our cyber um, fund, it's about 300 or so million, million dollars a year. And we've had some pretty, um, some, I would say there's been some real successes uh, through this, such as Qualcomm and others that, that really um, have taken off. And I, I would say sort of owe, owe much of their, owe some of their uh, success to being funded by uh, SBIR initially. So I, I've, I've really focused, I think, on um, pathways um, that are focused on industry. But another pathway that we see is open source. Um, and so we have uh, created this program called Pathways to Enable Open Source Ecosystems, or POSE. And this is the realization that not all ideas need to be commercialized. There are uh, plenty of other ways through open source ecosystems that, um, that we think things can be successful. And so um, this is a, a program designed to create self-sufficient, self-sustaining um, ecosystem, open source ecosystems. It doesn't necessarily need to be as, as sort of I think of like Linux or you know, many IT um, software programs are, are open source, but this, this is a little broader. It does not necessarily need to be IT focused. Um, so there's certainly hardware, uh, informing regulations, those kinds of things that we're sort of, we're, we're keeping the, the definition of open source rather broad here. Another program that has been um, very, I, we've gotten a huge amount of interest is accelerating research translation or art. Art is um, focused on, um, academic institutions that have a strong research um, capability, but don't necessarily have a, a strong translation uh, capability. And so this is a grant to academic institutions to increase their translation infrastructure, um, really to help those PIs sort of, you know, go through the translational research pipeline to, you know, whether it's um, starting a startup or selling their, you know, selling their, uh, their technology um, patents. Um, we, we were astounded by the number of uh, proposals that we got uh, when our, I think it was several hundred. We were just shocked. Um, so we've received all the proposals and now we're um, going through them, which is a tall order given that. The quantity, but but we we definitely see that we're on to something uh, just by the amount of um, interest by the community. So those were um, about the translation. I'm going to touch on um, sort of the the topical the uh, the topical translation, the topical development. Again, those ten, ten key technology areas that are in the Chips and Sciences Act. So uh, Noble Reach Emerge is a, a nonprofit that we've partnered with to, uh, to really accelerate um, discoveries that have come out of our biological sciences directorate. So we're identifying uh, 10 or so uh, programs out of, again, out of bio that are ripe for translation. Um, this, this will provide both um, money and resources to help uh, develop the technology. So sort of, you know, the, the science part of it, but also um, the expertise, uh, the mentorship and um, sort of the background uh, to help companies or to help researchers start a company. Um, and so this is still relatively new. I think we have three or four um, PIs that have started in, in uh, the Emerge program, and we're working on several others. 
So, um, uh, Alan, I'm keeping my eye on the time. I want to make sure there's plenty of time left for discussion. And this group is really quick on the uptake. So can we maybe just very quickly get through the rest of the slides? So we have Absolutely. I'm going to pick it up. So hold, on to your, hold on to your seats. <laughs> We're buckled up. <laughs> OK, so uh, one, one thing that I do, so I think this program is really cool. So I'm going to just pause a little bit on this prototype open knowledge networks, just because I think it helps illustrate a point. So TIP was charged with 10 key technology areas. Our budgets, let's say it's 800 million. If you do the math, that's 80 million or so per technology area. That's not going to really move the needle on some of these technology areas, say, such as artificial intelligence. And so we're doing a lot of thinking about how can we help you know, move the needle on some of these areas. And for artificial intelligence, our, our, you know, our, our answer is this open knowledge networks. So this is, this is really a program to help create the data, sort of um, smart uh, open knowledge networks are basically databases that have meaningful connections between um, the elements in the database. This is really about creating the data to help researchers then train their uh, machine learning algorithms. Um, so again, we're not necessarily investing in specific AI ML technologies, we're investing in the infrastructure. And we see this as you know, sort of a model for how we can uh, approach all the 10 technology areas. Okay, um, we do have a dear colleague letter out asking for input um, for TIPS roadmap. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, we really are interested in what the community thinks on what TIPS future investment should be. Okay, we're near the end, I promise. I'm gonna hit workforce development uh, pretty quickly. We have uh, several workforce development programs. Um, this one called Excellent is all about experiential learning. How can we provide experiential learning from, as we say, from K to gray? Um, and it, it, this tackles all three of those areas. So the, the, there are really three tracks. The first is um, sort of K through 12, and that's primarily curriculum development, maybe some internships for high school students. The new graduates uh, aspect is how can we provide online, or excuse me, experiential learning opportunities for new graduates in STEM fields to get them interested. And then our final is career pivoters. So folks that might be in industry, how do we give them experiential opportunities in STEM uh, career fields to help them you know, pivot to a, a STEM field? So um, that's excellent. Another one is uh, a, a entrepreneurial fellowship through the Activate um, nonprofit that we've partnered with. And this is to help researchers, individual researchers, to give them both money and infrastructure to complete their, uh, their products, their research, excuse me. And then we also have another dear colleague letter out asking for um, uh, thoughts on how we can approach uh, the missing millions. So we have our three focus areas. Um, you can see them right here. I won't go through them again. We see partnerships as really foundational to all this. So please reach out if you're interested. Um, and then I do wanna just, the, the final slide here is in, you can, I'll send you the slides. You can um, peruse these later, but the Chips and Sciences Act gave TIP quite a few things to do. And you can see where we are in the broad list of, um, of areas. Um, there, so you can peruse those later. And then finally, we like to show this because partnerships isn't just with academia. Um, and we wanna help those, those different sectors find where, uh, where you know, they can um, coordinate and collaborate and partner with NSF. Okay, so I appreciate the prompt to speed up. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> um, and Thank you. I am definitely open to questions. Great, super interesting stuff and great overview. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. Um, I'm sure there will be questions and maybe I'll start out with Jason and then I'll go to Mona. Thank you, Alan. A, a lot of these uh, products or technology or information data products 
I'm wondering if you could speak to if there is room for commodities as a product. You had food security and aspects of bioproducts and potentially health development and, and so on and so forth. Wondering what room there might be for those types of things and particularly the blue economy. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, so we, we did actually have a convergence accelerator track focused on blue, the blue economy. Um, and if you're interested, um, you can you can see all the, the funded programs on uh, the convergence accelerator website. I think the convergence accelerator is a, you know, that is that is going to be a way for us to focus on some of those harder commodity things as you as you mentioned. The other, I would say, primarily primary way we're addressing that is through the regional innovation engines. Um, if you look at the, the different uh, focus areas that the engines have, many of them are um, kind of that hard, hard tech, for lack of a better expression, um, that I think, you know, it's going to take several years, I think, for the engines to see, uh, to see results. But, but my hope is that the engines will get after um, sort of what, what you just addressed in your question. Great. Thank you. Mona? Thank you, Tuba. Thanks, Alan, for the great presentation. I have, a, I have two questions, actually, so I'll speak my first question. Um, as a research administrator, I find it's very, very difficult to have uh, academics work with industry. And, uh, you know, it's hard enough to work outside your own discipline, far less uh, partners outside of academia. Um, have you, uh, in your administration of the, of the different regional um, engines or, or other uh, funding uh, opportunities that come out of the TIP directorate. Have you encountered some of those challenges? I wonder if you could reflect on some of the challenges that um, you uh, have faced as, as a TIP directorate. And my second question is, I think it's implicit in these regional um, engines that DEI and the, the, the idea of engaging end users in the co-production of knowledge, I think that is quite implicit in uh, the work of TIP. But if you could reflect a little bit on diversity, equity, inclusion, how TIP uh, addresses these, these uh, areas, I'd really gr greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, we, uh, so we are, um, we are, I'm not going to say struggling, we're spending a lot of energy trying to partner with industry. Um, some of those, I, I, I didn't include some of our workforce development programs, I'll, I'll send them in our larger deck with companies like Micron and Intel and Samsung, IBM. Um, but your question is, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, NSF, we are standing up, I would say the first thing is we we're standing up a partnerships office that is, is um, really focusing on how we can bring different sectors together. Um, and so I, I, I can imagine that because NSF is struggling with it, that, that institutions like yours are struggling with it too, just because we speak very different languages, I think, uh, and our timelines are very different. Um, so we certainly don't have the answer, but we do know that it, it is going to take um, building trust-based trust, trust -based partnerships. We recently, uh, it's been about a month and a half ago, we had an um, a industry summit where we brought almost 60 different companies together to, um, to, to really talk about the industry academia I don't know, divide may be the wrong word, but how we can uh, come together. So we're still working um, through sort of bringing uh, those industry groups together, um, but they had some really fabulous ideas on what makes, what partnerships, um, what, what a successful partnership looks like to industry. So please stay tuned uh, to that. The second um, about DEI, um, so many of our workforce development programs have, I would say, an aspect of that built in. Um, and, you know, just the definition of um, the missing millions, I, I hope you can see the link to um, sort of the diversity and inclusion that, that we're trying to get after. Um, we do have several programs, I think, that we're, um, we're working through. They're 
they aren't finalized yet, but we're, you know that we're hoping can address uh, even more sort of our um, MSIs that um, can can at least provide more opportunity to students there. So, um, but I would say it's baked into everything we do, um, and that isn't just for TIP. That is uh, the NSF director's mandate to all of TIP. Thank you. Let's, let's go to Peter. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Um, I have two questions, but in the interest of time, feel free to you know keep your response as brief as you, you see fit. But so I understand the convergence accelerator model of having a cohort around a theme. And my first question is, is there a mechanism, a kind of on-ramp, if you will, if an individual or team wants to address a previous theme? That's question one. And then question two is really about broadening participation. You know, how much, um, is broadening participation baked into TIP's mission? You know, do you have data on the demographics of those engaged in the programs you support? Um, do they look different than NSF, et cetera? That's it, thanks. Uh, to your first question, we, we don't have a mechanism to, to go back um, for previous conversions accelerator topics. Um, and I, I think we, we just have so many good ideas that that we're, just, we're trying to move forward. Um, so your second about broadening uh, participation, um, we we have lots of data. I think lots and lots of data. NSF has huge amounts of data, as you as you probably know. Um, our challenge right now is finding as as we develop the metrics. I think is what what data what data do we focus on um, and. We have some ideas. I, I won't share them now because they're very pre-decisional. Um, but but I would say that um, one of the I would say one of the the areas we are spending a lot of time on is how do we know that an engine is successful? Um, and the inclusion aspect is absolutely built into that. Um, but you know we're we're talking like is is it patents filed? Is it jobs created? Is it you know, how do we measure the, the underserved community, uh, you know, sort of their, their ability to participate in an engine and other uh, NSF programs? So I don't have a great answer for it, to be honest, but it is something that we are uh, thinking pretty hard about. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Um, we have uh, eight minutes and lots of questions still. So um, uh, if we can move through as many as we can, that'd be great. Ajit. Thanks much. Um, just curious to get your sense of um, how you're seeing this issue where technology for societal benefit, as you put it in the in, in painting slides, um, with a large market works differently than technology for curiosity driven science, which often fails because there isn't a market size. How does TIPS sort of think about that challenge and what they might do to make a difference in that? Does that question make sense? I think so. Um, yeah, I think um, trans translation is. I don't. I don't think I need to tell anyone here. Translation is really hard, and um, every path, every good idea takes a very uh, unique path. And so, <laughs> and so, I, I think one of the things that we're trying to do in Tip is we're trying to you know. How can we create an infrastructure? I think that that can address all these great ideas that have unique paths to follow. Um, and Alan, I, hey, Alan, I think Ajit's question actually gets a little bit at that success metric uh, issue. One metric of success is is the technology going to launch and be self sustaining in the marketplace. But maybe another way to measure success is, is the technology going to enable data collection that was never possible before or discoveries that, you know, even if it's never going to be self-sustaining in terms of in the marketplace, it still might be a huge success if TIP could enable some amazing breakthrough that would result in um, us seeing the ocean, and for instance, in ways that we never did before. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. I agree i'm i don't have a great answer for you <laughs> to be honest janet nope i think you guys just asked my question oh yep. sweet excellent shimi 
Hi, Alan, thank you so much. Um, I'm, my question is kind of tangential to Mona and Peter's question about the EI. So please feel free to keep it brief, but you know, getting, getting at how these um, awards are actually um, drawn out or rolled out and implemented. Like, do you guys have a, um, an outreach strategy for the partnerships? Like, do you just post it on the website and go, or is it kind of like, you know, you get the word out in some ways so that you reach specific, you know, nonprofits or, you know, specific target um, industries? That's my first question. And then the second is, you know, um, it gets into kind of like, um, you know, what requirements or guidelines have you guys talked about? are there for like co-development or co-production of knowledge, um, specifically nonprofits, you know, I'm looking at some of those partnerships um, so that the partnership is equitable and that they're doing, partnerships are doing their due diligence to make sure that, you know, it's not, um, that it's, it's act, all the dot, I's are dotted and T's are crossed. The, um... Your, so your first your first question I, it, it is uh, very I would say close to me I, I resonate with your first question because um, obviously NSF has incredible reach into the academic community and the relationships we have span decades we don't necessarily have the same uh, reach right now for uh, for both industry and nonprofits and so our first year has been frankly pretty reactive when it comes to um, you know, these partnerships. So it's been someone approaching us, I think, um, saying, hey, I have a great idea, let's do something. I, from year two onward, we are trying to be much more proactive and assessing what are the communities that we need to reach and what are the institutions that represent those communities. And then let's, let's go that direction. I would say um, we're not there yet, but we 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 understand that it needs to be it needs to be the other way around, right? We just can't rely on this reactive nature. Um, could you repeat your second question? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, it was kind of convoluted. I, I was wondering, you know, it follows that second, you know, you guys reaching out to specific um, partners. Um, if there's, if you guys are talking about specific guidelines in the RFP or whatever that ensures that there's co-development happening, you know, with the partners. Yeah, absolutely. So many of our programs are requiring partnerships. Um, in fact, I, I think I'm trying to think. Um, yes, most of our programs are requiring that. Of course, the engines. I mean, that's all about partnerships, um, and so you know, partnerships is in our name, right? And so that, uh, it's really those multi-sector teams. Um, now the devil can be in the details on like who's doing what. Um, and, and so that's up to the program officers to really dig into that, to see whether it's appropriate and equal effort. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, there's also a question in the Q&A that came from the public and it looks like this idea of TIP enabling um, uh, you know, technologies that, that help us with our research, even if they are not, um, you know, necessarily market um, neutral, um, it, you know, that is essentially creating a feedback loop, right? Because the more we can discover about the ocean, for example, or the earth, the more than that is going to lead to new ideas that will be marketable down the line. Um, so I guess a strong suggestion that that feedback loop may be something that um, uh, you all could consider. Um, and then um, I'll add a question in the just a few minutes left that we have. You mentioned that the uh, Advancing Research Translation Program received immense uh, interest. Um, hundreds, I think you said, several hundreds of proposals. Um, that to me is not a surprise from where I sit um, in an academic institution with very research active faculty. Um, you know, our faculty, um, specifically the faculty who I might think of who could really engage in this space, are certainly busy with basic research that they're already doing. And we, of course, are steeped in how to write an NSF core proposal, right? We've been doing this since, you know, infancy in a sense when we were grad students. Whereas, you know, I know writing an SBIR or SDTR or any kind of other proposal that is more connected to industry is a whole nother beast. That and, and I think faculty do require the time to learn how to think in new ways 
Um, and certainly the advancing um, research translation program was providing that opportunity. So um, my own personal view, you know, I encourage you to really um, think about broadening that program in order to um, really get us to the point where we have the, the workforce, the, the, the PIs who can, who have the time and knowledge and know-how to engage in this very important space. Yeah, I and if I could just add to to your comment, um, we we have heard uh, from the community that it would be that it can be challenging to apply to many different NSF programs, sort of serially, as opposed to you know, could there be a mechanism that might allow uh, a program or, or an idea, a PI, to sort of move through a process or let, let's say an infrastructure process again implies linearity. Um, and I, I think we are taking a look at, you know, how can we make this easier for the PIs um, as, as they, you know, navigate this lab to market platform. Um, we have a lot of ideas, um, again, still with their infancy, but, but we want a, a key to translation is reducing that sort of the, the barriers to and roadblocks and you know crazy paths that um, that you might have to take to to getting to putting your idea into practice. So yeah. I, I agree. Well, Alan, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It really was a great overview, and you all are doing an immense amount of work. And um, we are we are really thrilled that we got to hear from you. And thank you also for those who attended this open session. Clearly there's interest from outside of this um, small committee as well. So um, thank you again. And thank we you. see you later. <laughs>